But uh, as I said, we're going to be in um, Isaiah 6, and that's where I'll be exclusively today. And feel free to grab a Bible and pull that out. And if you don't own a Bible, we have Bibles we would love to give you. Uh, let me know. We will get you one of them. There are some in the Welcome Center. I have a bunch more in my office. And if you don't own a Bible, or if you know somebody who doesn't own a Bible, let us know. We will make sure that we get you a Bible to give to them, or get you a Bible for your own personal use to go with that. Well, we are in the uh, 21 days of prayer, and this is kind of our wrap-up on this sermon series. If you didn't get a copy of it, um, we have a 21 days of prayer. This is called the Dangerous Prayer, Prayer Journal. And we do still have some of these, and you can also get it electronically online. If you haven't been here for these or whatever, that's okay. This is a wonderful tool. You could use this in June and still get a lot out of it. It's not calendar-specific. It just happens that we've been working through 21 Days of Prayer as a church. But you can still take that and still use it on your own. Maybe get a copy of it, use it next year again for a second time, and just refresh and renew yourself. It's a great useful tool no matter when you choose to use it. But uh, feel free to grab those and use those and and, uh, be blessed by those. But our passage, as I said, is going to be Isaiah 6, chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read those for you, and then we're going to work our way through those and see what God has in store for us. And so if you want to read along, feel free. You'll probably see them here on the screen as well. And Isaiah 6 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. For I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hands a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Now let me help you out with, uh, uh, make sense of this and understand this a little bit better with some background and some info on on the history uh, of this period of time in the world and in the Bible. If you don't know about Isaiah... Um, Isaiah was a young preacher at this time who lived in the southern kingdom of Judah, the southern part of Israel, and this is the 8th century B.C. And and his remarkable statement, Isaiah 6.1, he says, In the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And and, and for us, that's more uh, more than just simply a chronological date that he's throwing in there on some ancient calendar. Um, This is Isaiah giving a designation of of political and spiritual circumstances. So we understand the context in which he was living and and, and the way things were going on in Isaiah's homeland at the time. You need to know about Uzziah a little bit. Uzziah was one of the few great kings of Judah. If you've read your Old Testament, you know spiritually Israel is on this, this roller coaster of up and down. And it's more down than it is up. And when you read about these Old Testament kings of Israel, more often than not it says, and they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, right? Um, Because they tended to be knuckleheads. And uh, they were a lot like us, actually, so we don't want to be too critical of them. But they they were sinners, and they didn't lead their people well all of the time. But Uzziah was one one of the kind of jewels among these kings. And uh, he had this long, long reign. He reigned for 52 years, longer than any other king in all of the time for the southern kingdom. Uh, He died in 740 B.C. We know that historically. And so his 52-year reign would would effectively be the equivalent as if we had the same president in the United States from John F. Kennedy to Barack Obama. Could you imagine that? That's 52 years. That's how long he reigned. And so... It was a long reign, and what happens oftentimes in long reigns is it tends to be times of prosperity, as it was in this. He was a a very savvy administrator. Um, He helped conquer the Philistines towards the Mediterranean. They conquered the Amorites under him to the south. They they, they took out the the Edomites who were in the Arabian desert. 
He helped improve the wall of Jerusalem to make things more secure. He built a, a port city in the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, they built a number of cities that were storage cities out in the desert um, that they could you know, store stuff away and protect things for things like famine or war or whatever else. He was a huge champion of agriculture. One of his uh, hallmark things was he, he, he greatly expanded uh, the, the nation of Israel's water supply. Um, he, he had a program that they dug numerous wells throughout the country. And then not only did they do that, um, they built aqueducts, you know, and so they were able to channel water from place to place. Now, we don't think much of that when we live here, but if you live in a desert climate, your, your communities can only grow as much as water as you have to provide, right? You can't grow food and you can't grow houses or anything like that without more water supply. And so a lot of things in the Middle East are dictated by water. And so he, he was a, a great expander in that regard. And then he greatly grew the Israeli army. The, the army at his time grew to over 300,000 highly trained soldiers. And so he had a, a pretty good time. But, and there's always that but, but it was also a time of uncertainty, particularly in the world as a whole. Uh, to the north, uh, Tiglath Pilesar III, which is a mouthful to say, uh, th this leader of the Syrians, um, he had begun to kind of rattle his saber a little bit and began to threaten the northern kingdom of Israel. Israel's to the north, Ju Judea's to the south. And, uh, and in fact, it would be just a short 18 years later before the Assyrians would swoop down. They'd, they'd come through Samaria, wipe all of them out, um, and, and eventually come and, and take custody and overtake all of the southern kingdom as well. And then in addition to that, this time period was a time of enormous superficiality. Uh, and this comes somewhat, I think, as we read these stories and look at these histories. The superficiality, I think, is a result of, unfortunately, King Uzziah not always leading as he should. You see, there were these things, these places that they called the high places. And in these high places, they tended to build altars. Well, one of the things that came under his reign, unfortunately, was that on these high places, altars were built to false gods. Now, many of the Israelites, of course, would go to the temple, but they often would just go there and kind of pay lip service. And then they'd go to these high places later or at different times and go and worship other gods from other kingdoms in those places. And they, they frequently frequented these, these pagan altars. And so it was, of course, the king's responsibility to make sure that these things were removed that these things were destroyed. Yet, Uzziah did not really see that through. He didn't put an end to many of these high places. And all of this converged in kind of a perfect storm. And it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, um, for, for the people of Judea and, and in Israel in this time, in our modern context, this would kind of be like us saying, in the year that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, or in the year that President Kennedy was assassinated, or, or in the year that the terrorists flew into the World Trade Center. We remember those dates, right? I mean, I know exactly where I was when those planes hit. I know exactly where I was when the space shuttle exploded. We have, those dates are seared into our minds. We know those dates. And in the same way, the people reading the story of Isaiah, when he says this day, when the king died, it would have been a date that was seared into their minds. And in this news, of course, that the king had died, had, had begun to spread from town to town and house to house, the king is dead. And he had been a good king, as I said, and he had led prosperity. and He had been king for a long time, and when that happens, fear begins to come, right? What's going to happen to us now? The people began to wonder. And not only was there fear, but of course a tsunami of grief comes in, because and, 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 he was a much-loved king. And so they, they probably flew their flags at half-mast. The, the nation was, was on the verge of a, of a nervous breakdown, not knowing where to go and what to do. And Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now that means that Isaiah's gaze was diverted from an empty throne and an earthly king to an occupied throne in heaven. You see, the focus had been on this earthly king. And they had failed to see the true king. Earthly power, as we know, passes from hand to hand. You've got King Henry I, King Henry II, Charles I, Charles II, right? And so on. But there's no God the first, and then God the second. God doesn't get decrepit and die, and then there's another one. That, that, that doesn't happen. That's not how it works. God is God, the eternal, the one, 
the only, the everlasting King of kings and Lord of lords. And as we study that God, and as we learn about that God, we see that that God can, can see us and view us as if He has a, a, a you know, so to speak, a telescope. He sees everything with His omniscience. And He's got omnipresence. God is all-seeing and, and all-present. One of the great things we learn out of the Bible, we see this in the story of Jonah and many other places, is God is everywhere. We can't run from God. There's nothing we can do. We can't hide from God. There's nothing God doesn't know. And not only is he omniscient, and not only is he ever powerful, but of course, he is omnipresent and omnipotent. He's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the, the Alpha, the Omega, and all those things. We've, we've, many of us as Christians, heard those things. But we need to be reminded that he is those things. And like Isaiah, occasionally we do need to be reminded. I think it's a great time to be reminded, in fact. Uh, Tony was just praying about it. Many times we need to be reminded as Christians that it's not large armies, it's not governments, it's not political diplomacy. Um, those are not the fundamental forces on which the welfare of our nation hinges. And us, just like the time of Isaiah, we're in a time of prosperity. You know, things are pretty good. But we're also in a time of uncertainty. And also, we're certainly in a time of superficiality. I don't think anybody would argue otherwise, right? And we too, just like the people then, would benefit from a fresh vision of our king, high, lifted up, seated on the throne. I, of course, have nothing against governments. I have nothing against armies and diplomacy or any of those kinds of things. In fact, I think God actually gave us those things. Governments, leaders, military, diplomacy. Gave us those things for our benefit. But we do need to pause and remind ourselves that it's Jesus and that it's Jesus alone who saves us. And we can never lose that focus. You see, folks, the church is the hope of the world through Jesus Christ, not any of those other things. So let's finish looking at verse 1. It says, In the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe it filled the temple. The word Lord there, in, in verse 1, is interestingly not the word Jehovah, if you've studied you know, the uses of, of the word Lord. This one's not Jehovah. Jehovah would suggest that uh, the, the essence of God's divinity that they would be talking about. But instead, the word used here is actually Adonai. Adonai talks about God's dominion when that word is used. And the throne in verse 1, and the word king in verse 5, as we'll get there in a little minute, it, it reinforces this point. This point that God in His dignity, God in His glory, God in His wonder, uh, uh, God as a spectacle, and, and not as a trite spectacle, but as something to behold, that God was seated upon the throne. And then He has this, this train of His robe, it says, right? Well, why is that included? Well, basically, the bigger, the longer the train of your robe, the more important you were, right? You ever been to a wedding where more than one woman had a train on her dress? No, you haven't. I bet not. Only one lady gets to have the train. Because she's the big important one, right? And so when you've got this train of your robe, I mean, imagine. You know, I, I've seen pictures of wedding trains, of, of, of these Dresses that, you know, are ten feet behind the woman, right? And it's kind of a way to show off if you're a lady. Now they're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it says, this train that God has, it fills the temple. Right? It's not a little ten-footer. It blankets everything. Could you think of a, a greater train than that? That's kind of what they're trying to say. That's what Isaiah is using here. And then as we read verses 2 through 4, we should get this feeling. We should come before the living God and, and have, have an awe for Him. All of these things that are in verses 2 through 4. The seraphim, they're calling out, the shaking of creation, the, the smoke, all of those things are there so that we see God and God alone is worthy of our worship and praise. There is no other that is. 
Nothing else can even come close to him. He is the creator God, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, full of love, full of justice, great beyond our possible comprehension, holy above anything that we could possibly imagine, perfect in all things, the one and only worthy of glory, honor, and praise. And when we come before him, we should bow our heads. We should bend our knees. We should feel our hearts burning in our chests. And we see as Isaiah comes before the living God, he comes before the presence of God and knows that he is not worthy. Now through this experience, Isaiah is a changed man. You cannot come before the living God and not be changed. And look at verse 5. And Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. And he says, For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah becomes painfully aware in this moment of his sinfulness and of his personal need for God's cleansing forgiveness. Woe, right? That word woe. I mean, when I talk about with a horse, like you're riding a horse, whoa, right? When else do you use the word whoa, though? We don't use whoa. It's not part of our common language. It's not a word that we use much in this day and age. Woe is a word of lament. It suggests brokenness and bereavement. And if you read Isaiah 5 right before this passage, you'll see a whole bunch of other woes there as well that Isaiah shares that... that Focus on all the problems of the world and those things going on outside of himself. But this particular woe is a personal, internal one. See, Isaiah admits his own imperfection. He admits his own unworthiness to be beholding God in heaven. And this happens, as I mentioned, all during this kind of moral decline in the nation of Israel. The nation had begun to fall, the king had fallen. And Isaiah too admits, I am fall, I am fallen and flawed. And it's in the midst of this very mess that God's holy perfection breaks through. And it stands in contrast to so many of these things. God's holiness and his perfection is, is a diamond among a trash heap, so to speak. And then he gets to verse 6. And Isaiah says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. You see, Isaiah Isaiah needed to be cleansed. He needed to be cleansed before he could come before the perfect, the infinite, the living God. And the same is true for us. And the good news is, we don't have to have a seraphim come flying to us and burn it off of us, right? That's good news. How many of you want a searing coal up against your lips later today? Anyone? No. Pass. You ever watch those people walk on the hot coals? Crazy. Right? We don't want that. Instead, though, instead of a searing hot coal to burn the sin out of us, Instead, we have Jesus. Jesus who came to take away the sins from the world. Jesus who came to seek and save the lost, to restore the broken. The one who came as a sacrifice on our behalf so that we could be reconciled with the very same living God that Isaiah encounters. But just as Isaiah, God won't and can't tolerate our sin. So we need Jesus. We need His righteousness. We need His forgiveness. Forgiveness that is found in Christ and Christ alone. And just like Isaiah, if we have Jesus, then we are cleaned, then we too are redeemed. We have our guilt taken away just as He did, and our sins are forgiven. And that's exactly why we need Jesus. And once we have Jesus... Then verse 8 comes into play for each and every one of us. 
Verse 8 reads, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah responds, he says, Then I said, Here I am, Lord, send me. When Jesus comes into your life, when God moves in you, you are changed, forever changed. Now I think sometimes we get comfortable with our faith, right? We, we kind of go on a, a spiritual autopilot. Maybe we're not doing bad things, right? But sometimes we're not really engaged. We're not really plugged in. We're not really going and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Maybe that's why you came here today. Maybe God wants to use you. Maybe He wanted you to hear this and be challenged to be part of the great things that God is doing. You see, when, when, when God forgave you of all of your sins, past, present, and future sins, I hope you saw that as a, a profound event in your life, a date seared into your brain that you will never forget. See, God didn't have to do it. You certainly didn't deserve it. And without question, you could never earn it. Yet God, God bothered to care enough about you. He cared enough about you, each and every one of you, and me included, to love you in spite of you, in spite of your sin, your failures, and your brokenness. God loves you. Hear that. And when we are transformed by that love, we are then empowered and challenged and called to take that love to others. And by others, God means everyone, whomever your life crosses paths with. I want you to think for a second. Who in your life needs to hear about Jesus? Who in your life needs to know about God's love for them? We should all know somebody, right? Many of us, it's many people in our lives. Who in your life needs to hear about God? Who do you know who needs to hear about Jesus? I don't care if you like that person or not. That's not at question at the moment. I don't care if it would be difficult for you to talk to that person or not. Who do you know that needs to know that God loves them, that Jesus died for them, that He conquered sin and death and rose from the grave? Now, as we know, only God can change the human heart. But you see, He uses us as His ambassadors. And maybe like Isaiah today, God is calling you to be faithful to Him, to share His love with the world. The dangerous prayer for you this week is to begin praying for somebody in your life who needs to know Jesus. Start with just one or two people and start praying for them. But like Isaiah... We have to go beyond just sitting at home praying and hoping and wishing that somebody would come to know Jesus, right? We have to actually get out there. We have to actually share Christ's love with that person. We have to go and do something and make that connection with that person. God is, is saying to us, just like He was to Isaiah, Whom shall I send? And how many of us are willing to pray? Here I am, Lord, send me. That might be uncomfortable. It might be awkward. I don't always know the right words to say. But I will be faithful. You see, when you begin to pray for others, and you begin to pray that God would use you, that where God, God would move in and through you, when you begin to pray those dangerous prayers, things start to happen. Enemies become friends. Sins are forgiven. Reconciliation happens. But it begins with our prayers. And I want you to pray a dangerous prayer this week, that, that God would begin to move in your life, and move in the life of someone that you know who needs to know Jesus. And then that God would begin to move in both of those and bring you two together that you might reach out to that person. Imagine the celebration that we could have if each and every one of us only had one person. Just one person that we reached in the year to come. And this room was doubled. And it's not about this room. But twice as many people loved Jesus as they do today. Imagine the celebration we could have. Imagine the celebration that would occur in heaven if each and every one of us would pray and God moved 
and revival sprung forth. Imagine how different lives and eternities could be with Jesus as the guide. So who will you pray for? Will you pray that dangerous prayer that God might send you into their lives? Take time today. Listen to the Lord. Seek His special assignment for you. Who do you have for me, God? Here I am. Send me. Pray that prayer and see what God does. Let's pray.